ओके लेट्स गेट स्टार्टेड ओम सहना बबतु सहनाओ बुनक्तु सह वीर्यं करवा बहै तेजस्वी नावदी तमस्तु मा विद्विषा बहै ओम शांति 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 ही यो अंतह प्रविश्य मम वाच इमाम प्रशुप्तां संजीवयति अखिल शक्ति दर स्वदाम्ना अन्याम श्चहस्त चनन श्रवनत्व गादीन प्राणान नमो बगवते पुरुषाय तुभ्यम लसतु श्रीमदानंद तीर्तें दुरुनो हुरुदंबरे यद्वच श्चंद्रिका स्वांत संतापं विनिकरंतति पदवाक्य प्रमाण ज्ञान प्रणम्य शिरसा गुरून व्याकरिष्ये यता बोतम विष्णु तत्व विनिर्णयम ओके सो गुड आफ्टरनून गुड मॉर्निंग एंड गुड इवनिंग एवरीवन आम आम क्वाइट एक्साइटेड दैट वी आर गोइंग टू डू आ the 27th uh, session on kataka upanishad we've had 3 to 4 weeks of break from katha upanishad and i hope you had uh, an opportunity to go back and uh, revise and ruminate and uh, try and think about the sort of concepts that are being discussed in katha upanishad which as you know is part of the krishna ajurveda it is one of the key upanishads of the krishna ajurveda uh, devata here is वामन नाम का परमात्मा छंदस इज अनुष्टुप छंदस ओके सो यू यू आर फेमिलियर विथ ऑल दैट सो लेट्स गो इन सो वी आर करंटली डीलिंग विथ सेकेंड अध्याय सेकेंड वली या देर आर अबाउट फिफ्टीन मंत्रास टू गो थ्रू हियर ईच वन एज यूशल इन द स्पिरिट ऑफ कथा उपनिषद ईच मंत्रा इज अनबिलीवेबली प्रोफाउंड एंड डीप so in our best tradition we will try to understand each mantra in all its glories and from various dimensions so what was the first verse the first verse went like this puram ekadvashadwaram ajasya avakra chetasah anushtaya na shochati vimuktascha vimuchache etadvai tat so that was the first verse that um you remember here we are still in the third question right that uh, our friend nachiketa has asked yama you know i need to know about the supreme brahman i need to know about what is moksha stiti i want to know about what is my own position in moksha and what is the greatness of the supreme brahman in the state of liberation these are all the high level philosophical question that nachiketa has asked and that is such an important question that yama is actually very happy that he's got a very good student and he has not stopped and he has carried on explaining this right from the second valli of the first adhyaya and he carries on all the way to the end of the second adhyaya third valli so there is so much to be said about this brahman so this very first verse here talks about the state of our pindanda the state of our body and just to get folks to just to wake everybody else who is going to remind us as to what are the 11 gates of this body so we are all very familiar with this so who wants to take that up who wants to tell us about the 11 gates shall i pick somebody pragnesh thank you so two eyes two nostrils two ears mouth uh, the ex- ex- excretory organ the genital organ uh, so that and, is nine uh, and umbilicus yeah that is 10 what is the 11th one uh, the brahmarendra final the the top most yeah brahmarendra yeah so that is the anterior fontanel so yeah. from anatom so those are the 11 gates which is slightly different from what krishna has said where he said navadware pure dehi and krishna is talking about once you are born and before you depart you have nine gates but before you before you come out of your mother's womb you have the 10th gate which is the umbilical cord that links up the placenta to the to the to the child and then when you pass away and if you have done all the sadhanas then you go through the anterior fontanel or the sahasrara chakra and krishna has again said that if you go through this if the jiva departs through this gate the 11th gate then it goes directly through the root of the sun to 
moksha. So that is what uh, Krishna has said and Kataka Upanishad also picks up the same, you know, exactly the same, 11 gates. So then um, uh, here Yama has reminded us, but yes, you have 11 gates, but your Anushtaya, Anushtaya means Anusandana, Anusandana means how do you approach this? How do you constantly remind yourself? So you remind yourself that you got this body with 11 gates and this gate, this body with 11 gates is not mine. It is totally under the control of higher beings, not only the Abhimani Devatas, but ultimately the Supreme Brahman who controls everything in Brahmanda and also the Pindanda. So I actually don't own anything. This is just a vehicle that I have come in. I did not choose to come into this vehicle, but it just happens that I'm here. So when we take that kind of approach of total dependence and there is this independent being, then what happens? Na Shochati. So that person just goes through life without major, he doesn't get major, you know, he doesn't get uh, stressed out with all the things that we go through in our professional, personal lives. But a person who understands this philosophy, na shochati, he's not worried. And he lives as though he is already liberated. Yeah, Muk jivan muktas are they called vimuktascha vimuchyate. Why? Because that etadvai tat, that one that is there as your antaryamin in your jiva, which controls this whole body, is the same one that is going to control you when you shed this body and leave the linga sharira and you go to muktasthana. Okay, so that was the very first mantra with which our uh, Guru Yama started off with the second valley. Then, of course, over the last two and a half, three sessions, we have been spending a lot of time talking about the next mantra, which as I told you is also called Hamsa Gayatri. For those of you who are not familiar, or of course, most of us will be familiar now. This is a, a very core concept of Kata Upanishad. Some people do a, a lot of uh, contemplation about Hamsa Gayatri. And I will make a, my confession. So when I walk from my hospital car park to my office, I recite Hamsa Gayatri and I, and I walk to my office because it's such a profound mantra. So what does it say? Hamsa Suchi Shat Vasu Antariksha Shat Hota Vedi Shat Atitir Durona Shat Rishat Varashat Ruta Shat Vyoma Shat Abja Goja Rutaja Adrija Rutam Brihat. So this is a Gayatri Chandas. There are two verses here. There are two Gayatri mantras here. 24 syllables and together they form 18 words and we have seen all that. So I'm just giving you a quick revision of that. So remember 18 words in the two Gayatri mantras that we have here. Okay. So, and again, of course, after we have done the Hamsa Gayatri mantra and my aim today is that we complete or understand um, the Hamsa Gayatri mantras. The rest of the Gayatri mantra we will finish today. And then from the next sessions, we got amazing verses. Urdvam pranam unnayati apanam pratyagasyati madhye vamanam asinam vishvedevaha upasate. Uh, again, an amazing verse. So we will do that next week. So what is this Hamsa Gayatri all about? So we did these, the, we did the first line. Yeah, we spent two weeks talking about the first line because it is so important. Hamsaha Shuchi Shad Vasu Antariksha Shad. So what does that mean? Hamsaha and uh, Pragnesh Bhatji spoke to us about uh, Hamsa and the and the and the yoga aspect of that. And we have dwelt enough on the physiology, the medical aspect, the physical aspect of what is this Suchi and what is Hamsa. Okay. Hamsa in the primary sense, Hamsa is Hamsa Namaka Paramatma. Ha, Ham and Saha. Yeah. Saha Saratvat, Hanyamanatvat, Ham. Yeah. So that which has no defects and that which is full of auspicious attributes, that is what is Saha means. Saratvat, Saha. And Hanyam Hatum, Ham. Ham means that which is discarded. So this G, this Brahman has discarded all the defects. So he has no defects and is full of auspicious attributes. And that is why he is pure. So the fact that this is a white swan is not, is metaphorical. It's not that Brahman has a form of a swan. It is to bring home the idea to us that this Brahman is a pure being with no defects, but full of auspicious attributes. And where is this Brahman? most celebrated in the Vedas as present. He is, of course, everywhere. But the Vedas talk about his presence in one being. 
as a very important pratika or a symbol for us to worship. And he talks about that as Suchi, Harish. Uh, yeah, just maybe we covered this uh, before, uh, Madhuji, but uh, is Hamsa also in some uh, translated as sun sometimes? Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, that's huh. good. So I'm going to come to that a bit later. I've got okay, a slide no coming up, Harish. Oh, so oh, no um, hang on with me. So that's an interpretation, Taitariya Aranyaka. So I'm going to talk about the Taitari Aranyaka in a, in a few slides. Yeah. So that Hamsaha primarily is Swan, the Parama Mukhyavati, Parama Mukhyavrati. That is the way he has been described primarily in the Vedas is the Supreme Being who is called as Hamsaha. And he is in Shuchi. Shuchi also again means pure. Pure means pure Jiva. Pure Jiva. So we are not pure. Okay. If anybody says my, I am a very pure person, they are kidding themselves or they are just fooling themselves around. We all have all sorts of defects in us. We are full of defects. But in the, in the, in the universe of the sentient beings or the Jivas, there is a gradation of Jivas of various type. And then there is this concept of what we call as the Jivotama, the one that is the highest Okay. Chaturmukha Brahma, as you know, is, is one of the highest, he's the highest jivas. And Chaturmukha Brahma and Mukya Prana or Vayu is, or, or they both go together and they are considered as the purest of jivas. So they're called as the jivotamas. So Suchi implies primarily the pure souls. Yeah. So that's Suchi. Again, we have discussed enough about what is the importance of that prana because hamsa comes in that prana right hamsa is about hamsaha hamsaha inspiration expiration is an idea there about the yogic practice which is about prana pranayama and etc so and we discussed about how this prana and there can be no no arguments on that prana the metabolism the way your body provides makes the energy. Because if your body does not have metabolism, it is as well as it is called a dead body. So only the body that has metabolism is called a living body. And the Abhimani Devata of that metabolism that happens in your body, the Vedas describe that person as a Mukhya Prana. And that is in all Upanishads. Any Upanishads that you take, Prana or Mukhya Prana will be discussed. So I've just, I, we just discussed a few examples like this Mukhya Prana being given an example of Aranaba. So if you have a chariot with spokes, the one that holds all these spokes is called Aranaba. So that Aranaba is how Mukhya Prana is discussed. And in Chandogya Upanishad, he is celebrated as Madhukara Raja. So the, the, the head of the bees. And now we know that is a queen bee. And if the queen bee is in the beehive, the rest of the bees are here. When the queen bee leaves the beehive, everything go away. And that's what happens to our body. When this pranatattva leaves, there is no metabolism. The body is dead. All other fellows, the, the abhimani of, this, of the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the touch, and everybody else will have to leave. So that is an excellent example that is again described in the Upanishads. And then of course, uh, Brihadaranek also talks about this Mukya Prana is the horse that drives this body called the carriage. So these are all beautiful analogies to talk about who this Suchi is. So we spent a lot of time talking about the first verse, Hamsaha Suchishat. Then we said, the next verse was Vasu Antarikshasat. So our Yama is saying, this Hamsa Namaka Paramatma, this omnipresent being is in this highest Jivotama called Mukya Prana. So he is the highest among the Jivas. Then he takes the example of Antariksha. Antariksha is space. And he says Vasu Antariksha Sat. Okay. So the Vasu there again etymologically is Va stands for Vara and Su stands for Sukha. Vara means para, the highest. Su means sukha. So the one which is blissful, the one that has the highest bliss. So that is the Anandamaya, as you know, is one of the definitions of the supreme being. So that supreme being is called Vasu here to again bring home the idea that he is full of bliss, infinitely blissful. Yeah, Satchit Ananda. So, and again, Veda Vyasa has done the very first Samanvaya Sutra called Anandamayo Abhyasat. So, Brahman is Anandamaya. Why? Because Taitariya Upanishad re repeatedly talks about this. So, that is a literal meaning of Anandamayo Abhyasat. 
in Taitari Upanishad that Veda Vyasa has resolved. So that Anandamaya Brahman is called Vasu. And where is he? He is all pervaded the Antariksha. Sat means what? Siddhati. Siddhati means that which is indwelling. So this being is indwelling in the Antariksha. So we did these two verses. So now the question is, why does Yama talk about these two? He could have picked up anybody, right? He could have picked up Agni to say Vasu Agni Shat. He didn't say that. He started off with Vasu Antariksha Shat. Sky, as you know, is the, in the Panchabhutas, it is the first thing that is the first evolute that comes from the Tamasa Ahankara Tattva. There you get the Tanmatras and then you have the Panchabhutas and the first evolute is the Akasha. So, that is where the clue is. And again, I, I'm not tired stressing this again and again. Our, when our Upanishads talk about these, these ideas and in the sequence, there is a purpose to it. So why did he take Hamsaha Suchi Sat? As I said, highest, purest among Chetanas. That is why Yama takes this. In the highest, he is there. By implication, it means he is also there in all of us. Okay. Then, Antariksha, sky, it is the subtlest among the Panchabhutas and is untainted. Okay, it is, it never gets dirty. The sky. You're not talking about the air pollution here. The air pollution is in the sky. Okay. So that sky is never tainted by any dirt. So that sky is again taken as an example and says that even in the Vasu, the same Vasu is there in this Achetana Vashtu. So that is an important idea. The first one is talking about Chetanas, sentient beings. And the next one, the next one is talking about Achetanas, that is the Panchabhutas and the Satlas. And as how he is he as Sat, Sat as I said is Siddhati as an Antaryami. Okay. So he has spoken about Hamsa Suchi Sat, Vasu Antariksha Sat. Then what Yama does is he then asks about how on earth he is he in on earth, how is he contemplated? Okay. So in the sky, we know he is as a Vasunamaka, and in and in uh, in the Mukya Prana, he is as Hamsa, and as Harish mentioned, sun, and I'll come to that in the sun, he is also pervaded. Okay. So on earth, how is he? How is he remembered or how is he worshipped? So that is the next verse. And this is the new verse for today. Kota Vedishat. Okay, so again, when you look at it very superficially, it, 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 okay, it's very simple. Kota. Kota means what? Kota means Hotra. Hotra means what? The priest. And what are they doing? Vedi. Vedi means Kunda. Uh, what are they doing? They are doing Yajna. So when you look at it superficially, it means when you are doing Yajna, he is there. Okay, he is he is he is pervading all the yagnas. And for those of you who are doing havans in temples, you know that the 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 the, the purohit or, or the or the priest will will invoke the presence of the supreme before they do these yagnas. Yeah, and that is the idea that Yama is talking about to some extent. But there are some deeper meanings that we will talk about now. So hota vedishadu. So what is hota? Hota means literally it comes from the word hotru. Okay, so that is when you do yajnas. So when you do proper yajnas and, and what Yama is talking about is, you know, uh, the, the various types of yajnas. And again, we, we have done it in Purusha Shukta uh, session. So go back and look at those slides. And I just want to take one important example called Soma Yaga. Okay. The Soma yajnas that used to be done in the Vedic times. And these are huge yajnas and very important yajnas, Vedic uh, havans that was being done. Now people do in rarely, but it still happens in India. And I'm not aware of any Soma Yagas that happens outside of India. Okay, So how does the whole, uh, Soma Yaga happens? Because to understand this verse, Hota Vedishat, we need to understand a little bit of anatomy of a Soma Yaga, Soma Yajna. So how does that work? There are four priests. Okay, Hotru, Advaryu, Udghatru, Brahman. The, those are the names of the four priests. Hotru is the priest, he, he put what is called Shastra Mantras, he recites the Rig Veda and he has three assistants, Ardi, Tri and Padi. Okay. Then you have the Advaryu who is from the Yajur Veda lineage and he will say Swaha and put the you know uh, Ahuti into the fire. He is the Advaryu and he has got three assistants. 
Udgatr, Gatr, as you know, is song. Udgatr is the priest who recites the Samaveda in a very musical way. As you know, Samaveda is musical. So he will be singing and he's got three assistants. So four singing the Samaveda. And then Brahman is the supervisor. So he just ensures that these three chappies, that is these 12 chappies, or reciting everything properly and he's got three assistants. So that is the proper anatomy of a, of a Vedic Yajna. Okay. If you count them, how many? 16. Okay. Then who is there? There is a Yajamana and there is a Patni. There is a husband and a wife. So they are also sitting there. So primarily for a Soma Yaga, there are 18 folks. No surprises there. Yeah. In this forum, we are very familiar with 18 and 16. So even the way in which the yajna is structured has got deeper philosophical meanings. It is not just rituals of people just dressing up and going and sitting and throwing stuff into the fire. So my humble request is next time you do a havan, watch how the Purohit is doing. And you can even ask him and challenge him and so on. So that will make it more interactive and understand how does it fit in with the Vedic philosophy. So ideally, you have 18 folks around this fire. Okay, So Hota, so that is the superficial meaning of what Hota is. Vedi is easy. That is a Kunda where there is fire. Okay, that is Vedi. Okay, so now Shat, Shat means Siddhati. So this Brahman, the supreme being is in this situation on earth also. So when you look at the philosophical aspect of it, besides understanding there are 16 is the Jiva, 18 is the Paramatma and this Yajna, which is Agni and Agni Mile Purohitam, we have understood that that fire is the Agni Narayana, where this uh, with, with the celebration is going on. And when Yama is saying Hota, so in this Vedi, he takes the name as Hota. What is Hota? Juhota. It comes from the Sanskrit word Juhota. Juhota means that which devours everything, that which eats everything. Okay. So our Brahman is the destroyer of the universe. Yeah. We know Agni also comes from Atti Iti Agnihi. Atti means that which eats. And that is what Hota is. Juhota. Okay. So I, I just want you to appreciate the, the, the linking of meanings of how Yama takes these verses. And I, I Again, I'm not tired saying this. Reading superficially from, from transliterations can be pretty dangerous stuff. But you sit down with a guru and read it properly, then the, the ideas that you get is entirely different. So this Juhota actually is what this Hota is, who is the devourer of all, who is called Agni, who is also in this Vedic Kunda. So in Pindanda, how does it work then? So outside when you're doing this yajna, that is the Brahmanda aspect. You're outside, you're doing it, you're going to the temple and doing it. But that is not that is uh, that is not what our philosophers, our Vedic philosophers want to think about. They also want us to think about your body itself as a kunda. And we have done this before. Your body itself is a Vedi. Your body itself is a fire sacrifice. And in that also he is there. Okay, Hota. Vedishate. So what is our kunda then in this body? So this is interesting and fascinating stuff and which is the core philosophy of the Vedas. What they are asking you to think about is, you know, your hearing, your tactile perceptions, your sight, your taste and your smell that you're getting from the external world. They are going into your indriyas, various indriyas. So those external tanmatras are the ahutis that go into this fire pit called individual indriyas. And who is doing that? The Abhimani Devatas are doing that fire sacrifice of putting all those ahutis of sense data into your sense organs. For whom? For the Supreme Brahman. And that is how our approach in life should be. But of course, we don't do that. We putting all these sense thingies for entirely different purposes, but not for the worship of the Supreme. And that essentially is the philosophy of uh, uh, Vedic sacrifice. Vedic sacrifice is not about getting material, uh, you know, getting rain and other things are there, getting rain and, uh, you know, good, good things for your family, having children, etc., etc. But th those are all secondary benefits. The primary benefits of the Vedic sacrifice is this, that that sacrifice that happens to the Supreme who is there inside you as your Antaryamin.
Okay, so that is the important message of what Yama is saying here as Hota Vedishate. Okay, so when I was thinking about this Hota Vedishate, it's all fine. You know, now I'd gone to India this time, and there was a Pavamana Homa that I was I was sitting through and and looking at it. That was amazing uh, to be part of that. But is that all to it? You know, we are not priests, are we? We are not priests. We are not, uh, you know, we are not Vedic pundits to do this. But I think what we do at our work is itself a Hota Vedishate. If you are a surgeon or if you are a physician, whatever you are here, think about this whole thing as a Vedic sacrifice. Yeah. And if you are a, if you are in the kitchen, think about what you do as a Vedic sacrifice. If you are in the office, Think about it as a Vedic sacrifice. Yeah, we don't necessarily have to sit around fire and, and, and do all this in temples. We can practice this in every day of our life, provided we have that kind of an approach. And that exactly is what Krishna has said in chapter 4, verse 24. So I'm going to break for a minute and get one of you to recite that beautiful mantra uh, verse from uh, chapter 4, 24, please. So who wants to take that? Brahmar Panam Brahma Haver, Brahmagno Brahmanahutam, Brahmaivat, Brahmaivatina Gantavyam, Brahma Karma Samadina. Beautiful Pratipaji, thank you very much. So that's a similar kind of idea that uh, Gita is uh, telling us, Krishna is telling to Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita as well. So view everywhere Brahman is there, and whatever you're doing, it's all it, it, approach it like that. Then if you do that, na sochati. You will not have any expectations. You will not be looking for rewards. When you don't get the reward, you won't be upset. When you get the reward, you won't be elated. You just you just do the job. Yeah. So next, what happens is the reason why I had to go through this whole cycle of um, what happens in uh, in in um, in Vedi in in a Yajna Kunda is I've told you about Yajamana and Patni, and I told you about all the sixteen uh, priests who are there in the Vedic sacrifice. So unless you understand this, you will not be able to grasp the next verse. So that's why I had to give you some background about that. So what did Yama say next? Atithir Durona Sat. Okay, Atiti is a beautiful verse because when you are doing in Vedic times, when you are doing a Vedic sacrifice, people will just turn up. You will have Yajamana and Patni and their relatives, but you will also have Atitis who turn up for the Vedic sacrifice. Okay, so I've got a small question here. The guys who turn up without any appointments are called Atitis, whereas you invite your relatives to come for the uh, Yajna, right? What are they called? Who is going to answer that small little quiz? So they are called Abhyagatas. So you have Atitis and Abhyagatas. So nowadays all the Vedic rituals that we do has only Abhyagatas. There are no Atitis. Okay. So what is the etymology of Atiti? Let's look at this. We have done it before, but it's interesting. A plus Titi. Titi is an appointment. A means without an appointment, he just turns up. Okay. Next way of etymology is also interesting. Ati plus Ti. Ti comes from Tam. Tam means Ta. Ta means food. Okay. The person who eats atitha, atiti, the one that eats a lot of food. So these are fellows who have been starving and then they suddenly turn up to the Vedic sacrifice where they know they'll get food and they eat a lot of food. So that is also another idea of who atiti is. But primarily, ati iti atiti, there is a typo here. So ati iti atiti, that which divorces and eats everything is atiti. So our Yama says, not only in the kunda, not only in the fire, not only in all the hotrus and the priest this Brahman is, he is also in the atiti. Okay, Atiti, he is there as a, as, a, as a atiti namaka paramatma. He is there even in the atiti who comes. And he says even in durona. Okay, this is very interesting. I've got an interesting slide coming up next. Durona shatu. Okay, so what does durona mean? So drona means the various things that means in drona. Drona is utensils for ahuti. So if you go to the temple and do the havan, he will have all these funny spoons, wooden spoons, where he takes the oil and then puts it in. So these utensils are called drona in, 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 in Vedic language. The yagna shala, where the sacrifice happens, is also called drona. And in Soma Yaga, as you know, there is the Soma sacrifice, the Ahuti. Soma is given as an Ahuti. So even the Drona, the Soma is also called as 
Drona. Okay, so there are three levels of meanings. And that is interesting. Why? Because as I said, if you are a surgeon and if you are in an operation theater, this could be your knife. This could be your operation theater. This could be all the disinfectant, whatever you do with the surgery. So they all become dronas in your profession. Okay. So even in those dronas, Shatu, Siddhati, he is there as an indweller in that also. Okay. Again, classic example of Brahmarpanam, Brahma Havir, Brahma Agno, Brahmana Ahutam, Brahma Eva Tena Gantavyam, Brahma Karma Samadina, as Krishna said in 4.24. So this whole structure of uh, Veda, uh, the Vedic Havan sacrifice, Yama takes that because in the Vedic time, this is what philosophers used to do, rishis used to do that in their ashramas and he takes this as an example to illustrate, see this Brahman is everywhere, whatever you do he is there, okay, that is what he wants us to remind, he reminding us all the time, yet we forget this, the moment we go out of our class, the moment we back to work on Monday, we forget this, okay, so the more we put it into our head, the more we do, you know, contemplate on this again and again, I think our work may become a little bit more interesting and less stressful. So now there is one interesting meaning of Drona, which is Soma. Okay. So I just thought this is an interesting point to have a slide about discussing what is Soma as per Vedas, because this is what Yama is talking about. He's talking about the Soma Yaga sacrifice and he's saying, you know, uh, Hota Vedishatu, Atitir Dronashatu. And he said, even in the Soma Jews, it is the Brahman who is there. Okay. So I got the summary slide of Soma. Before I do that, I put a question. Let's get folks to uh, share some ideas as to what they feel is Soma. What is Soma of the Vedas? Let's have a two minutes discussion on that. So who wants to start on this? Is Soma an intoxicant? So that's the, my first question. I feel Soma is the bhakti that we have. The, the devotion that we have to the Lord could be the Soma, I feel. Because it's more to do with emotion, mind, uh, all those. Thank you, uh, Pratibhaji. Very interesting uh, thought there. Anybody else? Deval, Pragnesh? Can I try? I don't know. But Soma is, Chandra is called Soma, isn't it? So whatever, I mean, uh, the energy he gives in the night because of the day's sun, whatever the plants and animals get, and we say that, yeah, uh, mind also he yeah. affects. And all these energies, I thought it's Soma, the rasa we get from moon. Yeah. Thank you, uh, uh, Shilaji. Yeah, again, int uh, very interesting uh, thought there about Soma. Uh, Deval or oh, Pragnesh, go for it. And then Deval. D desires, the worldly desires that we uh, pay and uh, sacrifice. Uh, so if our body is a sala and our indriyas are utensils, then through the, uh, the indriyas, the, all the desires that we have, we sacrifice those through and... Okay, intro, again, uh, excellent ideas, Pragnesh. Thank you. Devil? Um, so I had uh, I'd read about two things. One is what Sheilaji has mentioned, which is to do with the plant growth, uh, what sustains us in the night uh, with the Soma. Um, but it is, uh, I read somewhere that it is also a plant with white flowers, which is now extinct. So that, I mean, referring to your picture there. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. So uh, I think we've got a, a, a spectrum of ideas. Thank you, Devil. Um, so, so what I've done here is I've just given you a summary of this. Okay. Um, so let's take the first one that we have left with plant. Is Soma a plant? Okay. So Soma in Sanskrit, there is a word called Somalata. Somalata means it's a creeper. And in the Vedic times, there used to be this plant called Somalata. And a juice was extracted from this, from this creeper and that juice becomes the Soma. Okay. That is a very superficial uh, way of looking at what Soma is. Now, as Devalji mentioned, this plant is extinct. So nobody knows what this Soma plant actually is. And I was, you know, I shouldn't be doing this, but I did do a Wikipedia search as to <laughs> what, what they say. And there are various plants and fungi, mushrooms that are all being proposed to be potential Somalatas. 
Okay. Even cannabis sativa is there. I was a bit surprised. There is a there is a species of sugarcane that is also there. Okay. And ergot fungus is there. So all these are being proposed, but these are all proposals. They are all only hypotheses. But the fact is, yes, in the Vedic times, which is 10,000, you know, 5,000, 10,000 years, there was this creeper which was used during the Vedic sacrifice as a symbolism. So as I've told you so far in Soma Yaga, everything is symbolic. Everything is symbolic in Soma Yaga. The 16 priests, the Yajamana, the Patni, the Atiti, the fire, the Ahuti, the utensils, everything is symbolic of something much more profound that is being discussed in the Vedas. Okay. So for those folks who do the pseudo research and claim that our Vedic rishis and philosophers were, were consuming intoxicant, they just don't know what it all means. Yeah, they are far from what they are actually, you know, uh, aware of what the philosophy of the Soma of the Vedas is. So it's a very, very complicated, very amazing topic to do some research. So the first one is the plant that Devalji mentioned. And of course, uh, Sheila Ji mentioned about mental state that is also called Soma. In Greek philosophy, Soma in Greek medicine, in ancient medicine, Soma means cytoplasm of cells is called Soma. A living cell is called the Soma. Okay, that is also there. Then there is something called the divine force. There's some Soma implies a force that moves everything, that runs everything. That is also called Soma. Astronomical body. And again, uh, we've had lots of contributions about Soma as the Chandra or the moon is called Soma. And here is the idea there. Our friends in the Western world where we live, they call this as Monday. Okay, it was moon day that has become Monday. But what is Monday? Somavar. Okay, Monday in Sam Samskruta is called Somavar. Okay, then of course you have Somnath. Somnath, the, the one who is the who is the controller of Soma is called Somnath. And of course, we have a temple, right? Somnath. Okay. So they all come from these ideas of Soma as an astronomical body. And of course, Soma can also be the Chandra Devata. The Chandra Devata can also be Soma. Okay. But here is the primary meaning of Soma. Yeah. Forget about all these things that I've told you so far about who the Soma is. Okay. Forget about them. They are all very superficial meanings. They are helpful to understand, but we are doing studies on Vedas. So what is the Vedic meaning of Soma? This is dwelt with in the ninth mandala of the Rig Veda. Okay? In fact, the ninth mandala of the Rig Veda is called Soma Pavamana Mandala. Okay? And how many uh, suktas does it have? I made a note somewhere, 114 suktas. It has got 114 suktas, the ninth mandala, talks only about Soma Pavamana. Okay. So Pavamana means pure. Okay. Soma Pavamana, the deity that is pure, Soma Pavamana, ninth mandala of the Rig Veda talks only about this. Here is a brief idea. What, what is this ninth mandala? Who is the, who is the Rishi? Maduchanda Vaishwamitraha. Well, who is Madhutandra, Madhuchanda Vaishwamitraha? Who wants to answer that question? Who is going to tell us who is Madhuchanda Vaishwamitraha? His Vishwamitra sum. Okay. And the Devata there is Pavamanaha Somaha. And the Chandas is Gayatri. And that is how this starts. And some of these mantras, these are beautiful. Swadishtaya, Madhishtaya, Pavasya Soma, Dharaya, Indraya, Patave, Sutaha. It goes like that. And then the second line, Durona. Remember Durona that we talk about? So Drona comes there. So this Drona is this utensil here. And this Rishi talks about, we invoke this great deity called the Soma Pavamana, who will come and it goes on. And it is, as I said, 114 Shuktas talking about Soma. So the physical and the ritualistic things about Soma that we have discussed in this side of the slide, is totally irrelevant. The Soma is purely philosophical and spiritual. That is the meaning of Soma in Vedic philosophy. Okay? Who is this Soma then? Mukya Prana. The bliss of immortality after knowing the Supreme. That bliss is also called Soma. The Supreme himself in the highest sense is also called Soma. 
Okay. So because what soma is something that gives you ecstasy, what gives you ecstasy or the bliss, your liberation. And who is this Anandamaya Brahman? He is bliss himself. So those are all the ideas of Soma that you need to get. And in fact, there is a book that I would recommend for those of you interested in this. It's written by this very nice, it's very well written book. Um, James Kolomik, whatever his name is, he's a lawyer, but he somehow seems to be interested in Vedas. He's written a book and I purchased it from Amazon a few months ago just to do some reading. And he gives 1000 names of Soma over 300 pages taking from the ninth mandala of the Rig Veda and talk about who the Soma is. Okay. So now look at the etymology. Sa Soma. Sa plus Oma is Soma. Look at this Om there. Look at this letter S. Look at this A. So when you open this Chadayanti Iti Chandamsi. So when you look at Soma, you open it up. It opens in an entirely different way who this Soma is. Okay. So now the reason why we had to do this is when he said Atitir Durona Shatu, think about all these ideas about Soma that is being discussed. So, so far, what have we done? And so we initially took that he's uh, our friend, our guru Yama said that this Brahman is everywhere. And I'm taking this example of this uh, Veda Shala and I'm describing where Brahman is. And he's also talked about this Brahman is also in Chetanas and he said Hamsa Suchi Shati. Okay. So next what he does is, is in the next set of, in the, in, the, the, in the next set of words, we have done eight words so far. And in the next set of 10 words, he explains, he expands what he has described in the first set a little bit more detail. So what does he say? Nrushat, Varashat, Rutashat, Vyomashat, Abja, Goja, Adrija, Rutaja, Rutam, Brihat. Okay. Very, very important set of 10 words. So what do they mean? So he is expanding the Chetanas and he is expanding the Achetanas. And he picks up some key Chetanas and Achetanas and describes what is going on here. But also what I want you to do is, and this is again important when you do, uh, when you look at mantras of the Rig Veda, is to look at, there is, look at this here, there are three places Ruta comes, yeah? Rutashat, Rutaja, Rutam. Okay. There are three places where the Rutam comes in this particular mantra, which is very important because Rutam is a very key concept of Vedic philosophy. And one cannot navigate the Vedas without understanding what the Rutam actually means. In fact, I was just re uh, reading somebody's PhD thesis. Somebody wrote a PhD thesis on Rutam some 30, 40 years ago in Australia. And I was able to capture that in, in my Google searches. And I was just reading through the thesis. Amazing piece of work. And he says there that the word Rutam comes 450 times in Rig Veda. So that is that much importance that has been given to Ruta or Rutam. Okay. So I think we should spend some time talking about Ritam. So my idea for today's class is describe what is Soma, which is discussed by Yama, and also to discuss what Ritam is uh, as discussed by uh, Yama to Nachiketa. So before going into the details, just want to get some idea as to what we feel is Ritam. So who wants to you know, contribute there, please? What is your uh, view on what Ritam is? You would have done your studies and readings, individual studies. So what have you understood by the word Rutam? Harish. Uh, some some sort of an order, I guess. Order or law. Yeah, order, law. Yeah, great stuff, Harish. Anybody else? Okay, yeah. So Harish picked up a key, key idea of Rutam. Okay, so let me take, uh, uh, as I said, there are 450 uh, times Rigatam is, is recited. And then our friend in the thousand names of uh, Soma, as per the ninth mandala, he describes thousand different interpretations of Soma and he brings that Rutam also there and discusses that. But I'm not going to get that complicated because for our purposes, if you can take this message, I'll be very pleased. The way you approach Rutam is two aspects. There are two ways in which Rutam can be looked at. Okay. And everything else will fit into these two divisions or two ways of looking at what Rutam is. Okay. So the first one is Rutam is Rutam Yatartha Jnanam. So that is the etymology. Rutam Yatartha Jnanam. 
yathartha jnana means true knowledge so that which is true knowledge is ritam okay so we have done this before so then what is satyam then what is the difference between ritam and satyam anybody wants to take a guess or a view here what do we what do we think is the difference ritam i think you said yathartha jnana isn't it sorry shila ji come again pratham i think you explained as yathartha jnana as it is i mean god yeah his truth they call him satyam but as he, as he is ratham truth what is satyam then satyam is also truth but uh, ratham means it's about brahman isn't it so satyam so brahma ved apnoti par, uh, brahma ved apnoti param tadesha abhyukta satyam jnanam anantam so satyam is also a name of brahman okay so yeah thanks shila ji you got some ideas there so ritam is knowledge true knowledge whereas satyam is practical application of true knowledge okay so that is the difference in sanskrit language the subtle it's a very subtle difference but there is a difference nevertheless in in the vedic language ritam means true knowledge but satyam is the putting that ritam into practice is satyam yeah so ritam is as i said true knowledge so how do we get true knowledge not by going to the not by going to our universities but actually to read the vedas okay vedas are the in, vedas are the books that give us the true knowledge of the state of the universe so in that sense vedas are also called ritam okay vedas are also called ritam true knowledge is also called ritam and who is the abode of true, true knowledge our brahman who is pure knowledge himself abode of pure knowledge he is also called ritam okay so when you look at ritam in this way ritam yathartha jnanam it will naturally lead to vedas which is the source of that yathartha jnanam so vedas are also called ritam and that vedas talk about this the supreme being who is the abode of pure knowledge therefore that brahman also is called ritam so that is how you infer what ritam is in right side of this uh, this slide on on the left side here it gets a little bit more interesting ru rutam comes from a dhatu or a root word called ru gatau yeah, ru ru gatau iti dhatostu purva gatavat sada stitehe brahma rutam iti uktam rutam anrutam parimanatah so i'll come back to it again it's a complicated sentence ru gata viti datostu purva avagatau vat sada stitehe brahma rutam iti uktam anrutam parinamatah okay so work called tatva vidyota where acharya gives a definition of what ruta is so in that sense ruta means that which is changeless पूर्व अवगतवत सदा स्थिते है दट इज हाउ इट वॉज बिफोर हाउ इट विल बी इन द फ्यूचर हाउ इट इज नाउ इट इज चेंजलेस सो ऋतम मीन्स दैट विच इज चेंजलेस ओके दिस इज वेर हरीश इज आइडिया कम्स इन दैट यूनिवर्सल कॉस्मिक लॉ that universal cosmic principles by which this universe runs those are all changeless universal principles yeah there is a famous rigveda was data yata purvam akalpayat how the previous universe was is the current universe and the future universe will also be the same as the current and the previous infinite ones that have happened because that universal law is changeless so anything that is changeless is also called ritam okay so in that sense mula prakriti so think about this problem the rest of the material world gets transforms it transforms all the time it go, becomes more and more modified to panchabhutas and so on but the mula prakriti that is there in pralaya and there have been infinite pralayas for a long time and that mula prakriti doesn't change it is always there okay so mula prakriti is in one sense also called ritam and one of the jadas that never changes we have just discussed is called vedas vedas again are called or changeless that is why they are called amnaya amnaya means the sequence and the letters are changeless so that is why they are also called ritam and of course the vedas tell us the knowledge of brahman brahman is changeless he never changes he is just the same okay so brahman there are, and think about the word brahman again brahman there are various meanings of brahman right so who is going to tell us the various meanings of brahman here 
we have dealt, we have done this before. So what are the various meanings of Brahman? So Brahman means it comes from the root word Brih, that which is big. Yeah. So all Chetanas are bigger than jada, Jadas. So in that sense, Chetanas are also called Brahman. But among all Chetanas, the Chetanas that have been liberated are bigger than the ones that are in Samsara. So Mukta Chetanas are also called Brahman. Okay. And then you have the Chaturmukha Brahma, who is the highest among the Jeevas. He is also called Chet Brahman. Then you have Lakshmi Tattva, who has never been in Samsara. She is also called Brahman. And then there is this Parabrahman, who is the Narayana Vishnu himself. Okay. They are all come under categories of Brahman and they are also are changeless. Jeevas are not changeless. Yeah. We have our Swabhava and that is it. That Swabhava doesn't change. Our mind, material, external body, personality may change, but the Jeeva Swabhava never changes. So in that sense, Jeevas are Ritam, Mukta Jeevas are Ritam, Brahman is Ritam, Vedas are Ritam, Mula Prakriti is Ritam, Yatartha Jnanam is Ritam. Okay, so think about this because it's a deep concept of Vedic Rishis. They've captured these ideas in one word. And that is the beauty of the Vedic language. And you read any Western philosopher's uh, description of Ritam, the first thing they would start saying is, I cannot translate this word. We cannot translate this in German or English. It's impossible because it is a very, it's a very Vedic word which comes with so many ideas. Okay. So in Rig Veda, for example, it captures this word. Brahma, Brahma Eva Rutam. Anyad. Anrutam. Okay, so this is a, a beautiful word there in Rig Veda. Brahma Yeva Rutam. Anyad Anrutam. So what does that mean? Anrutam means that which is changing. That which is changing is called Anrutam, whereas that which is changeless is called Rutam. Okay, so I, the reason why I'm spending this is to understand this. What is this Ritashat? What is this Ritajaha? What is this Ritam that Yama is talking about? We need to have a background of this. So when you look at this from this perspective, which is a purely etymological perspective, there are some folks who describe Ritam as real, whereas Anritam as unreal or Mithya. There is no evidence in the Vedas, period. This is a hypothesis of certain schools, but nowhere in the Vedas Rutam is described as real, whereas Anritam is described as unreal. No, Rutam is described as changeless. Anritam is described as that which changes. Both of them have the reality. To remove the reality for thing that is changing is flawed philosophy in my view. I don't think it has uh, uh, approval from Vedas. You need to look at these verses. And that is exactly what Yama is talking about in the next verse. So he says, Nrishat. So first he says, so hold on to all these ideas about Rutam because we'll come to this. We got maybe another 10, 15 minutes to go through this. So he says, Nrishat. So he, he spoke about all the Vedas and the Kundas. He spoke about uh, Hamsa Suchishat, how he is there in Mukya Prana and so on. Now he says, look, is there in Rishat. Nr means what? Naras. Naras means what? You and me. Okay. And he says he is inside you and me. He is inside all of us. So when I say Nrishat, he is inside you and me and all of us, it also implies that he is in all life as we know it. He is in all life. And if you look at prokaryotes, it's archaea and bacteria. Then you become eukaryotes, plants, fungi, animalia, protista. And I've just picked it up, a, a very interesting picture. So he, Yama says, this chap, this Brahman, he's everywhere made. He's not only in Rishat, but by implication, he's in all life as we know it. And this is again a key Vedic philosophy concept, okay? That the Supreme Brahman and that Supreme Brahman is in all these jivas, okay? And that this Brahman and the jivas are everywhere in all living organisms. This is a key Vedic philosophy because many of you may not be aware or may be aware that many of the other Abrahamic philosophies consider only humans have souls, but your animal does not have souls. So you're entitled to kill and eat it. Okay. So that is the philosophy there in other schools. Whereas in Vedic philosophy, the approach is entirely different for us. Every life form has Jiva and has the supreme being in it. So you respect everything. So in the human form itself, 
when you look at this view that the supreme brahman is in everywhere you can ask your question how can we be prejudiced how can we have discrimination how can we be racist and how can we be casteist how can we be homophobic okay those are all the ideas and these are all the great philosophy of our hindu dharma or sanatana dharma because it all comes from these ideas of nrishat the supreme being is everywhere in that case how can you have all this prejudices all over the place they just don't make sense yeah so that is a higher ideals of our vedic philosophers whether we put this into practice is a different question but that is what they want you to achieve in your life so that is the sadhana that we are looking for and why is he saying all this and i have given you this example a million times tadeva anupravishati is what taitri upanishad says which is a very important verse that in all his creation he is there सो अकामयत बहुस्याम प्रजाये इति सतपो अतप्यत सतपस्तप्वा इदं सर्वं असृजत यदिदं किञ्च तत्सृष्ट्वा तदेव अनुप्राविशत तद् अनुप्राविश सत च त्यत च अभवत् देयर दिस वर्ड इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट दैट ही क्रिएट्स एंड ही परवेड्स ऑल हिज क्रिएशन एंड दैट इज व्हाट यमा इज टेलिंग अस व्हाट आर ऑल हिज क्रिएशंस ऑल फॉर्म्स ऑफ लिविंग फॉर्म्स and the highest evolved we are told is the humans on earth so nrishat he takes as an example then he goes varashat higher than the humans are these higher sentient beings that are scattered all over the universe we call them our rishis have given them names we call them as tatva abhimani devatas vasurudra adityas pitrugana devatas and so on it is just a name that vedic philosophers have given but our vedic philosophy always assumed that life is spread across the universe and there are higher forms of life that is jivas with higher levels of consciousness which we call as devatas okay and that is what they are called varas vara means para means shreshta high higher than humans okay varashat so who are those higher humans and we have done all these endless uh, abhimani devata discussions indra kashiva brahma ganesha you name all this he is inside all of them yeah okay? as their antaryamin so when you take that view how can we not adore and worship devatas in the right perspective yeah after all if vishnu is the chief executive lakshmi is the chief financial officer brahma is the chief operating officer there is a management hierarchy right and if i want to have a chat with the chief executive i have to go through the management hierarchy and then go and talk to vishnu can i just door knock my door on vaikuntha and then say hi and talk to vishnu no it is not possible there are some people who think that way but that is not the prescription of the vedas veda says varashat he is in all the abhimani exalted jeevas make them your guru worship them use them as a tool to reach me that is a clear message of the gitas don't worship these guys that they will give you moksha because they don't they is not in their capacity but you use them as your gurus and you find your direction to the chief executive that is what krishna has categorically said and when when yama says drushat varashat we should be thinking about these ideas okay so next is the next set of uh, ideas that that hamsa gayatri talks about rutashat vyomashat Okay, let's look at all this abja goja adrija rita ja rutam brahat so what does that mean to understand this okay and again um the some of the transliterations that i've seen is pretty shocking as to how they interpret these mantras without actually having a, a deeper understanding of what is it that the yama is actually talking to nachiketa to understand what this means we need to understand the sequence that we are all very familiar with mula prakriti sattva rajas tamas mahat ahankara vaikarika tejasa tamasa tanmatras bhutas indriyas karma indriyas jnana indriyas manas buddhi all the abhimani devatas everything you need to have this idea you need to have it in your head that is why those those journey of souls and all the fundamentals that we did is important to understand these mantras why that is the case let us look at this because rita shat so when i say rita remember i told you in the two slides before that which is changeless is rita so one of the changeless entities is mula prakriti in pralaya changeless it is just there like that so rita shat so yama says even before creation that mula prakriti is there he is there pervaded there rita sidati then he says 
vyoma shatu okay this is very interesting word vyoma vyoma has got various connotations one meaning of vyoma is space but yama has already spoken vasu antariksha satu space has already been discussed in the second word vasu antariksha sat is yama so so stupid that he is going to say the same thing again yeah so you cannot have what is called as punarukti punarukti means repetition yeah that is considered as a dosha in interpretation so this vyoma here is not the sky because that is one meaning of vyoma but the vyoma here is a bit more deeper okay very very interesting vyoma v plus oma oma means what om you add a a it becomes oma if you go to rigveda there are all these mantras that start with oma saha okay so oma we remember we did om vishnu's name is om and what is the etymology of om om otatvachi that is the root for om and that means all pervasiveness okay so there are two entities that are all pervasive okay one is supreme brahman or vishnu so who is going to answer who is the second person who is also all pervasive so who wants to answer that we as jeevas are all atomic but there are only two two tattvas that are all pervasive in vedic philosophy one is this om that is vishnu namaka and the other person is lakshmi thank you sudarshan absolutely right shri tattva is also all pervasive that is why she is called oma oma is in the strilinga om is pullinga oma oma is a name for lakshmi oma saha that which is all pervasive and who is this lakshmi always with this lakshmi is, is always with this chap who has a name called v what does v stand for who is going to answer that what does v stand for vishnu vishnu absolutely right so vyoma there actually means lakshmi who is always with vishnu v o ma okay. in fact there is one sutra by vedavyasa and he says samana cha shruti prakramad amrutatvam cha anupakshavo samana lakshmi is also called samana samana is another name of shri tattva or lakshmi why because she is also all pervasive like the vishnu tattva except that her all pervasiveness is dependent on vishnu that is the only difference but she is also all pervasive and yama says even in the vyoma tattva sad sidati the supreme brahman is also inside lakshmi tattva okay so i hope you were able to appreciate the sequence of thought of yama yeah not of the liter uh, transliterations that are available but what yama is thinking about that is what we are interested in so when he says rita shat mula prakriti vyoma shat means lakshmi and that makes sense because the abhimani of mula prakriti or uh, jada prakriti is chetana prakriti with is lakshmi no no problems there then there are these interesting words abja goja adrija rutaja rutam brihat okay so what is abja okay abja in, in, instead of going into not going into the details of etymology there are two ways you can look at abja abje shwaste abja ha apsu jayate iti abja ha abja is a name of chaturmuka okay abje shwaste means he is also inside chaturmuka okay he is not only in, Chet, in lakshmi but also in the abhimani of the mahat tattva which is the first evolute of creation right when you have shri bhu durga and you have sattva rajas and tamas and they mix the first thing that comes out is the mahat tattva so he is also inside abja so that is one way of looking at it i'll come to this a little bit later so then you have abja then he says goja so go go is again has got so many meanings one meaning here in this context look we got to look at prakarana yeah what is the contextual relevance here go vak vani again these are all rigveda mantras Va, vani saraswati is called go okay so go vak vani so chaturmukha's consort is who saraswati and when i said goja the sun who is born from saraswati and chaturmukha talks about rudra so he is not only in chatur in saraswati but he is also in rudra so once he once yama says that immediately he says adrija adrija is a very interesting word 
Adrija, Adrinath. What is Adrinath? Anybody heard of the word Adrinath? Adrinath is the name of Shiva. Some people have kept names as Adrinath, as Shiva. Okay, Adri. Adarani Atvat Adrihi. Without Rudra's blessings, without Rudra's grace, without Rudra's grace, we cannot go anywhere. That is fundamental yeah, in, in Vedic philosophy because he is the Abhimani of Manas. Without his, unless he graces us, we cannot make philosophical progress at all. So we are all under his, under his control in that way. So Adharani Atvat Adrihi. And again, these are all Rig Vedas. Yeah. So this guy is Adri. When he says Adri Jaha, Adri means Rudra. Okay. Adri equals Rudra. So Adri Jaha, Adri Jaha means the ones that have come out of Indra, of uh, Rudra. Ja means what? Born. Born from Rudra. Who are all the ones that are born from Rudra? Rudra is such an amazing being, right? He's got, what are the three uh, modifications of Rudra? He, he, you have this ahankara tattva that becomes tejasa, vaikarika and tamasa ahankara and each one becomes so many other things in the universe so that's why rudra is very very important and that's why he's called panchamukhi and he's got three eyes we've done all that in our previous class so not only the rest of the material world comes from rudra but there are lots of other sentient beings who acquire bodies that have been the the, the that are the material aspect of it is have all come from the ahankara tattvas so who are they everybody from indra downwards indra etc until us we have all come down from rudra and he is inside all of us okay eighth rank here is indra so who one of rudra's son is uh, skanda yeah also called subramanya so who is going to tell us what is the vedic rank of uh, skanda or subramanya any take us for this quick quiz Eighth rank, Skanda or Subramanya is, a, is the eighth rank, same rank as Indra. And Skanda is considered as the chief of the, uh, the army of the Devatas. He is the chief, general, is Skanda. Yeah? So all these, and Ganesha, of course, we all know is Rudra's son. And he is, uh, which rank? Who wants to answer that question? Which rank is Ganesha? Eighteenth rank. Eighteenth. Eighteenth, uh, uh, Akasha Abhimani. So they are all coming from Rudra. So he says when he says Adrija, all others that come from Shiva are also uh, this Brahman has pervaded all of them. Okay. Then he said Adrija. Okay. Then there is a word called Rutaja. Okay. Here it was Rutashatu. You need to watch these words. Here it was called Rutashatu, whereas here it is called Rutaja. Yeah. What is Rutaja? Rutaja means Ruta, Rut, Rutajeshu Aste Iti Rutajaha. And as I told you three slides before, Rutam Yatartha Jnanam. That Yatartha Jnanam comes from the Vedas. And that Veda is called Rutam. And when we learn the Vedas, we understand this Rutam who is the Paramatma. And when we understand that, we obtain our liberation. And when we obtain our liberation means that is it. We are changeless at that point. So those Mukta Jivas are also called Rutajas. Okay. So when Yama says Rutajeshu Aste Rutaja means he, he is inside the Mukta Jivas also. So this chap is everywhere. And that is why he is called Rutam himself. As, as I said in the Rig Veda mantra, Brahma Eva Rutam Anyad Anrutam. Okay. So this Brahman is Rutam because he is the embodiment of pure knowledge. And he is inside everything. He is called Rutam. And he is all pervasing everywhere. So he is called Brihat. So that is the sequence of thought of how Yama takes you through this philosophical journey for you to understand how this Paramatma is everywhere. You may call him Brahman. You may call him Paramatma. You may call Bhagavan. The three aspects, but they are all one and the same. But essentially, he is an omniscient being, omnipotent and all pervasive being. And that is why Yama finishes off with this word called Brihat. And Brihat means what? Atakasma duchate brahmeti brihantohi atsmin gunaha. That which is all pervasive in time, space and attributes. Therefore, Brahma Shabdashta Vishnaveve as Acharya establishes in all his works. When you look at this from this angle. Now I want to come to what Harish mentioned at the beginning of this class as to whether Hamsaha is also the sun. 
So that is another way of looking at it. So this explanation, Harish, is given in Taitariya Aranyaka. Okay, so if you look at that discussion about Hamsaha, there's Hamsaha is, Hamsaha is considered as a son. So when you look at it from that perspective, so here this becomes interesting. Abja, Goja, Adrija. So this is talking about the Gayatri. Okay, this is interesting. The Gayatri that uh, Vishwamitra saw, that sun and the Surya and the Surya Narayana, which is there in Gayatri and that we do every, Sandhya Vandana every day. That is what the Taitariya Aranyaka terms this entity as the Hamsa. And he says, this Hamsa, when I do the Gayatri celebration in the morning, what happens? Abja, he raises from the waters. Ab Apsujayate iti Abjaha. He raises from the sunrise from the sea. I mean, the Rishi sees this and he does his Sandhya Vandana or Gayatri Mantra. He says, Abjaha. He is inside that sun as Surya Narayana that comes out in the sunrise. Gojaha. Go means rays, sun rays. In every sun rays, he is pervaded and he is there is the contemplation of Gojaha. Then Adri Jaha is interesting. Adri. Adri means mountain. Okay. Adri means mountain. That's why our Shiva is called Adrinath. Yeah. Because he is the king of the mountains. Kailasha. Kailasha. Yeah. So Adri Jaha. So Adri Jaha means he arises from the sun. This Rishi, when he is in the cave and he sees the sun, he says, that is Adrija. So these are the three aspects of the Rishi seeing the sun that they worship as Gayatri in that. So Abjaha, Gojaha, Adrijaha. So I have got a small quiz here because I just wanted to do this. So who is going to answer this? Uh, I've got a small little mountain here. Where is it and what is the name? You've all been there. Most of you. No? Is it Tirupati Madhu? Yes, very good. Uh, Padmaja, do you know which Adri it is? Sheshadri. Sheshadri. No, the Tiru is there. Sheshadri. No. Sheshadri. Who is this? Anjanadri. No, Garudadri. Garudadri. Okay. <laughs> so there is Garuda there. So Garudadri, Sheshadri and so on. In Tirupati, you have the seven hills, right? Adri. Adri means mountain there. So that is what our friend is saying. Our uh, Rishi is saying here. Adri Jaha. That which comes out of the mountain. Yeah. So it is the same Narayana that is being celebrated here as Abja, Goja, Adrija. You know, the sun that comes, he is pervaded that he's inside that as Surya Narayana in all the sun. Okay. So these are all the symbolic worship that Yama is telling us. And this is not complicated. We can look at it when we go outside. So this is a symbols of worship. Yeah. So if you go to the very first verse, now Harish, this becomes interesting. So when you look at the first, he said Hamsaha. Hamsaha means the sun. Antarikshaha means the Akasha. Vedi means it's on the Prithvi. Okay. So this is a recurrent theme in the Vedas. And in the Upanishads. So when you read any Upanishad, when it talks about the Upasana, it will talk about Upasana three levels. On earth, in the atmosphere, and in, in the heavens. So that is what is Bhu, Bhuvaha, Swaha is. Prithvi, Akasha, Dhyav. It's a recurrent theme of the Upanishads, of the worship of the Supreme as having pervaded all this. So in sun as Aditya or Surya Narayana, in atmosphere as Vayu or Prana Narayana, and in Agni on earth as Agni Narayana. So that is how you look at this verse. So we are going to come to our final slide. So these kind of ideas that Yama has talked about is not new for us because this is a recurrent theme in Katha Upanishad. You may remember in, in the first Adhyaya, we did a verse, Indrebhyaha Parahi Artha Artebhyashta Param Manaha. Manasastu para buddhir buddhir atma mahan paraha mahataha param avyaktam avyakta purusha paraha purusha naparam kinchit sakashta sapara gatihi. He spoke about this purusha and then he said tad vishnoho paramampadam. That abode is called tad vishnoho paramampadam. It is not some Vaishnavite saying this. It is Yama in Kata Upanishad saying that this Purusha's abode is Tad Vishnoho Paramam Padam. And in this Hamsa Gayatri, he is finished with Brihat. Rutam Brihat. 
Brahma Shabdashta Vishnaveda. So that is what is the final conclusion of Acharya taking this Kataka Upanishad and telling us wherever in the Upanishads you see the word Brahma or Brahman and when the Veda Vyasa says Atato Brahma Jignasa and in that who is that Brahman? Not some Nirguna zero entity. Absolutely not. Acharya establishes that Brahma Shabdashta Vishnaveda. There are some folks who think that Saguna Brahman is Vishnu and that Nirguna Brahman is somebody else. That is their problem. But Vish Yama's declaration is very, very clear in Kata Upanishad. He has said, Purushanna Param Kinchit Tad Vishnoho Paramam Padam Rutam Brihat. And hence our Acharya says, Brahma Shabdashta Vishnaveva. Okay, so these are key ideas that, that we need to you know, somehow get it inside our head and, and do our practice. So that is the Hamsa Gayatri. So I think we can pat our backs that over three sessions, we have done Hamsa Gayatri and we have understood what is the significance and what are all the various ways in which we can understand Hamsa Gayatri. And then, of course, uh, next week, what Yama will be telling us is, as soon as he has gone to the lofty heights of Vedic philosophy, he'll bring you back to the Pindanda. He'll bring you back to your body. And he says, Urdvam pranam unnayati, apanam pratyagasyati, madhye vamanam asinam vishve devaha upasate. We'll do that next week. And again, look at this, vamanam. Who is Vamana? Vamana is a Vishnu avatar. Okay. And again, Yama is talking about Purusha, Purusha, Vishnu, Brihat, Vamana. Okay. This, is a, this is a very important Upanishad for Vaishnava philosophy because Kata Upanishad is talking about the supreme entity called Vishnu who is also called Brahman. And in the next verse, Yama is going to celebrate him as Vamana. And our Primary Guru Veda Vyasa has put a sutra there sh called Shabda Deva Pramitaha. So what we will do is we will take this sutra Shabda Deva Pramitaha and we will see what this is all about, about who is this Vamana, who, what is this Urdhvam, what is Prana, Apana and so on. So we'll go back and have that discussion and then we'll make our onward, onward journey. So we have done two verses in the second valley and there are 15 mantras. So we've got 13 more to do. So, and I'm hoping by the end of this year, we would complete the third valley also. So on that note, Krishna Pranamastu and thank you for listening. We'll 